Well, first let me say welcome and good evening. We're delighted that you're here. Thank you for joining us tonight at the exhibition opening for Strong Foundations, 100 Years of Hispanism at the University of Kansas. This compelling exhibit showcases interdisciplinary scholarship, collections, and creative works representing the century-long legacy of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Happy anniversary, Spanish and Portuguese. <laughs> Strong Foundations feature scholars who are making an impact in the world today and who have a voice in international conversations around a number of important current topics. We're fortunate to have an amazing rare book and manuscript collection highlighting these fields in the Kenneth Spencer Research Library, one that has been built over the years through collaboration between our librarians and other faculty across campus. To continue adding scholarship to the field of Hispanism, the libraries are at the beginning of an initiative to develop an archive dedicated to preserving the Latinx experience in Kansas. KU libraries are particularly honored to join in this special anniversary of a department that has made and continues to make such a great impact at the university. An exhibit like this takes a lot of hard work and a lot of hands. I want to thank first all of my colleagues at the KU libraries for their support of this exhibit. I also, not, I also want to acknowledge those who have had a special role in making this exhibit come to life. Thank you to the Harricombe Gallery Exhibit Committee and their chair, Sarah Goodwin Thiel, and to the Office of Communications and Advancement in the libraries. They've created many of the materials that tell the story of this exhibit. Very special, I'm, I'm looking around, very special thanks to Betsaida Reyes, who has such a remarkable skill in working with others. A skill that has made this exhibit development process run smoothly. And finally, thanks to Elspeth Healy, Letha Johnson, and Karen Cook, who were very generous in their time and expertise, showcasing special collections and university archives. We're very excited to hear from Benjamin Frazier from the University of, university of Arizona. Good. I want to make sure I get the right Arizona school. <laughs> but I'd like to begin by introducing our first guest, Santa Arias. Santa joined the faculty in Spanish and Portuguese in 2008. She holds an appointment in Latin American and Caribbean studies as well. Her commitment to interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches distinguishes both her mentorship of students and her contributions to the advancing of scholarship in Hispanic studies. Santa will introduce our main speaker, and please join me in welcoming Santa. I'm so glad to be here um, and uh, the opening of, of this exhibit and also in my time I want to thank a few um, people first to Kevin Smith for helping us and supporting this project um, and also to the uh, KU libraries um, librarians and staff who work so hard to make this possible uh, Particularly and um, especially, I am so impressed with Sarah Goodwin Teal. She's amazing. Um, thank you. Um, I love her job. Uh, she has great staff Samantha Simmons, uh, Megan Sherman, Kelly Spavin, who is the events coordinator here at the libraries. Nikki Birch, this is the second time I see her work doing um, the art design for a Hispanic Latin American theme. Uh, I also, and last but not least, Petsaida Reyes has been so important. I began a conversation with her 
a couple of years ago that led to the research for this, the, of course, the research and um, final um, exhibition. In the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, we received the support of Silvio Melener and Luis Sanchez this summer, who were supporting the libraries as well. Well, all of you will learn a little bit about the exhibit and what the faculty in Spanish and Portuguese and supporting faculty in other departments have done and their impactful work nationally. Uh, this morning when I was thinking uh, I about things, what to say besides introducing Benjamin, Fra uh, Benjamin Fraser Besides, of course, I need to get out of the script. <laughs> I decided to do some research about the Splat librarians that we had. And I was so impressed. I got into the archive of, the, uh, of their national association. And I was so impressed to find the names of all these Kansas librarians that have been so involved since the early years of the association. Some of them, um, some names that I found, Carbill, Gilberto Ford, Daniel Cordero, Ellen Brown, Rachel Miller, Shelley Miller, Jana Krenz, that some of you probably remember, Betsaida Redes that came here in 2013, and, uh, and of course, you know, Mary Rabble that has been uh, supporting um, that office since 2009. I also went, I want to thank all of them, most of them not here, and I also want to thank some very special librarians of special collections, um, Karen Cook that supports so much the department every year with orientation, introducing our special collections. also want to thank Elspeth Ely. I am amazed with her enthusiasm. She always gets involved and helps us a lot as well. And I want to invite here Mary, Betsaida, Karen, and Elspeth, because these flowers that are here are not for them. They're not part of this, they're for them. So, oh, wow. <laughs> Today, I, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote, Dr. Benjamin Fraser, who was, you know, you already know, he comes from the University of Arizona. One thing is that he could not be more perfect for this occasion, and you're going to hear why. One thing is her impressive academic record. Another, he's the editor of the major journal uh, for, uh, from the Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, and also for his service to the profession. Um, Benjamin Fraser received his PhD in 2006. He worked at Christopher Newport University in East Carolina before moving to Arizona in 2019. Um, he, as, well, as I mentioned, he's the editor of Hispania. He's also the founding editor since 2014 with Susan Larson, another good friend of the department of the series Hispanic Urban Studies. He's also founding and executive director editor of the Journal of Urban Cultural Studies. And he's the senior editor of the Arizona Journal of Hispanic Cultural Studies. His areas of research include, but they're not limited to, contemporary Iberian and Latin American film, literature and cultural studies, urban studies, and space studies, disability studies. He has published, and this is where I really wanted to die, 
He has published 10 single author books, edited seven volumes, and two journal issues. And I, decide, I didn't want to count the articles, but he has 86 articles. I want to know what's the recipe for this work, this productivity. Uh, I, if I list all the publications, we will not get out of here tonight. But I'm going to mention just some of the most important books of the most recent books. Um, 2019, Visible Cities, uh, Global Comics, Urban Images and Spatial Form, 2018. Cognitive Disability, Disability Aesthetics, Visual Culture, Disability Representations and the Invisibility of Cognitive Difference, 2015, Toward an Urban Cultural Studies, Henry Lefebvre and the Humanities, 2000, uh, 2015, he published the books. Digital Cities, The Interdisciplinary Future of the Urban Geohumanities, 2013, Disability Studies and Spanish Culture Films, Novels, The Comic, and The and Public Exhibition. He has, of the edited volumes, I uh, just want to mention a couple, Cultures of Represent from 2016, Cultures of Representation, Disability in World Cinema, Marxism from 2014, Marxism and Urban Culture, 2012, Capital Inscriptions, Essays on Hispanic Literature, Film, Urban Space in Honor of Malcolm, Alan Compitello, and I want to mention that because he's another great friend of, a great friend of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And he has edited two special issues in Hispania and in the International Journal of Iberian Studies. Benjamin, thank you so much for being here, for accepting the invitation, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thanks everyone for being here. This is a great crowded room. Uh, it's a nice rainy day. I'm actually enjoying that. Um, and I'm really glad to be here. This is, this is a very storied and historic department of Spanish and Portuguese in the nation. I'm really glad to be a part of, of what's going on here. Uh, I've been to Kansas many times. I have family actually from outside of Wichita, but I've never been to Lawrence. This is my first time here in this town and I'm enjoying it. Um, spending time with, with people from the department and also uh, spending time in the downtown area. Um, I do also want to thank Santa Arias for, and Sarah goodwin Thiel for the invitation and for orienting me to uh, the contents of the exhibit, which I, I still need to continue looking at. It's, it's very interesting. Um, and I also want to thank Sylvia Mulliner and Kelly Spaven for their assistance with the logistics. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes and I know I'm not uh, fully aware of, of everything that's going on to make this happen, but this, this is an incredible event and I'm, I'm glad to be here. I understand that in this exhibit, The Strong Foundations, uh, 100 Years of Hispanism at the University of Kansas, we are in the Heracom Gallery of Watson Library. Uh, you're reflecting on how our shared fields of teaching and research and outreach have developed here at KU, how that history was impacted by world events, World Wars I and II, the Dust Bowl, the Cold War, and so on. Um, I'm thrilled to be visiting with so many members of uh, our shared academic field in this esteemed department. I've been impacted by the scholarship of, of many who work in this department over the years, and I've been fortunate also to call upon members of the strong Department of Spanish and Portuguese for, for their assistance and for their disciplinary expertise uh, on many occasions. Most of all, in my role as editor of Hispania, the flagship research journal of the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, here at KU, you have the privilege uh, I believe, of being able to celebrate this full 100 years of history of our shared disciplines, which is something that not all, not many colleges and universities can do. This is, this is really exceptional. Uh, not all institutions can claim such a story past, nor can they honor, as you can, figures who are associated with the early years, the formative years of these disciplines, uh, and the development of what's uh, understood to be Hispanism in the United States. 
I've titled this talk Reflections and Reconfigurations, the next 100 years. It's not a comprehensive look at the past, uh, nor do I attempt to offer any definition of what Hispanism is, although I think there are some uh, good materials in the case on the wall that, that can help us think through that, that word. Um, and I must admit uh, that my own narrow research interest is not very closely related with this disciplinary history. Uh, it lies instead, as, as Sandalias was mentioning, with Iberian literature and culture, mainly the representation of cities, the representation of disability, mostly cognitive disability in literature, film, comics, popular music, and, and so on. But as a teacher and as a scholar and as an editor, I'm always looking to expand my horizons and to strive to be a generalist rather than just a specialist, in my knowledge. Um, and what I most enjoy about this profession is how it entails lifelong learning. You can always learn new things from colleagues. This exhibit is a prime example. Um, so this talk, I'm going to go back to the beginnings of the AATSP, which began in 1917 and end up very uh, somewhat abruptly skipping over a few decades uh, with the centenary issue of Hispania, which is the organization's flagship journal in December of 2017. Uh, in my remarks, I'm going to concentrate on two figures who were members of the KU department here. Uh, I think they do figure somewhat in the exhibit. Arthur Leslie Owen and Agnes Marie Brady. Is anyone familiar with those names? No, a couple people, and I, I do know there's some, some materials over here. Uh, I admit that these, these names jumped out at me early on when I was uh, learning more about the history of the story department. And I think they're important because from them we get this strong sense of how the past 100 years have always been about change, about adaptation to circumstances, and about innovation. Um, so the invitation to visit with you has pushed me to delve further back into the history of our disciplines, the history of the AATSP, the history of the journal. Uh, many of you may know that the AATSP was originally the AATS, uh, which is the American Association of Teachers of Spanish. Uh, Portuguese was not added until later, in the year 1944 to be precise, and thus in 2019 we're now in the midst of a celebration of the 75th year of the incorporation of Portuguese into the association. And some of you may also know that there is a special issue of Hispania focused on Portuguese that is in preparation that uh, will probably come out next year. Uh, what I consider remarkable is that the AATS was formed in 1917. This is prior to similar organizations for Italian, for example. The AATI was formed in 1923. Uh, the AATF, the American Association of Teachers of French, was founded in 1927. The AATG for German, also in 1927. So Spanish predates these other organizations by six to ten years. Uh, the first annual meeting of the AATS, AATS was held in 1917 on December 29th in New York City. Uh, Hispania, its journal, uh, has been published co continuously since then with an organizational issue in 1917 and four issues or more, in fact, uh, each year since then. And I, did, I looked up the prices of the journal for 1918. 1918. <laughs> You can guess, right? Uh, $2 for yearly subscriptions, $2.30 for international, uh, and the single issue price was 50 cents. Uh, things are a lot different today, especially if you look at library subscriptions, right? Uh, I, I won't tell you what those cost. Okay, so I'm going to start with Arthur Leslie Owen. I'll tell you a little bit about him and some lessons I've pulled from his, his record, his legacy. So he was born in 1885. Uh, he died in 1934. On the occasion of his death, Jose Maria de Osma, who was also a faculty member here in the KU department, uh, wrote in Hispania uh, that his passing was premature. He died around the age of 50. Uh, de Osma charts in that obituary Owen's scholarly trajectory from an idealist to a realist. In the end, De Osma writes, Arthur Leslie Owen became a kindred spirit of Spanish author Pio Baroca, whose works he studied. Owen published in Volume 1, Issue 1 of Hispania from 1918, and in a number of issues afterward. Uh, and I, I'll just give you some thoughts from selected publications of his. Uh, what emerged for me in this um, was that there was a, a certain balance of his interests in literary study, in pedagogy, and in the notes on how the profession, our shared profession, was developing and how it should develop. A lot of intentional thinking there. 
Um, in addition, a theme that allows us to think through his legacy, uh, a theme with contemporary importance, I think, as we think about the changing uh, structures of universities, the, the new challenges that we're facing, is that of specialization, or rather, a healthy skepticism regarding specialization. Uh, first, a brief tangent of sorts, which I'll keep brief on specialization. As a student of the contemporary period myself, when I think of specialization, I'm thinking of a sea change in modern social organization. I'm thinking of a twin legacy uh, of industrialization and of urbanization, the gradual reorganization of work and labor in 20th century society, the division of the working day, right? Uh, this way in which labor becomes fragmented. This applies both to physical labor and to intellectual labor. So you can think of um, factory laborers working on a narrow slice of a larger production process, but similarly, knowledge itself becomes fragmented. It becomes conceived of in terms of modern disciplinary expertise, it's imagined through lines of intellectual inquiry that are in principle autonomous from, if not separable from each other. Now, interdisciplinary modes of experience today in the 21st century are a constant challenge to this way of thinking, but the tendency of thought persists all the same. And most importantly, it becomes solidified to some degree in university structures uh, and operations. And this, so this is to, true to the degree that we all think of ourselves as specialists. And I admit that I, I take part in that discourse. So we identify primarily as a teacher or primarily as a researcher, or we concentrate on one specific time period, one specific subject matter, uh, one specific area of the globe, uh, one research question, one pedagogical focus or approach. And this mindset that we often fall into as a matter of habit uh, does not really represent how our shared fields have developed, uh, nor does it help us imagine where we're all headed in the next hundred years. So how necessary then for there to be those like Owen, who albeit 100 years ago, saw specialization for what it was, which is a limitation, a challenge. Uh, so I'm going to draw from his record three uh, pertinent points that I'd like to share, and then afterwards I'll do the same for Brady. So point number one from Arthur Leslie Owen, we need educators who will teach the student and not just the material. So even today, if we're thinking of specialists, we're tempted to teach the material and not teach the student, um, the subject matter over the person. This is one way in which specialization impacts education. Paolo Freire and Bell Hooks have written compellingly of this transactional model of education known as banking education, right, where knowledge is deposited directly into the container of the student's minds. This approach is not sufficient today in the 21st century, I think many would agree, and it was not sufficient in the 20th either. It's important that in an article from Hispania's first issue, titled First Year College Course in Spanish, which he co-authored uh, with two others, that the authors are attentive to, quote, the needs of the college student who has had little or no other foreign language work previously. They note the importance of the fact that, quote, the teacher should be able, even in a first year course in college, to instill into the student some notion of and appreciation for the spirit and the culture of the people whose language is being studied. They also affirm directly that, quote, the primary object of teaching is to teach pupils rather than subjects. Uh, this, is, this is a message that's still of vital importance today, and it's interesting to see how, how continuous that message has been. Point number two, we must recognize the needs of the student. So two decades into the 20th century, at a time in which modern language education was on the rise, uh, itself prompted by continued cosmopolitanism, urbanization, migration, war, grammar translation was being viewed as an insufficient pedagogy. In the article Spoken Spanish in the University from Volume 2, Issue 5, published in 1919, Owen uh, historicizes the growing awareness that students must be taught to speak the language, not merely to write it or to translate it in writing. This is a time, Owen notes, during which, quote, the spoken language is all but unheard in the first two years of language courses. The Great War, he writes, the Great War, having profoundly affected almost everything else, seems likely also to exert an influence upon modern language teaching. Quote, it is becoming apparent that we who teach the languages, if we are not to fail in our duty, must teach our students to speak the language we profess or admit that we are incapable of doing so. The plea that our purpose is to do not this, but something else, will no longer be accepted. So Owen is calling for a reconfiguration of the discipline. His is a perspective that rescues languages from the specialist niche 
and applies it to living social relationships. Very important. Point number three, in this process of attending to student needs, we must not instrumentalize education. So educators who resist specialization must also remain aware of the tendency to instrumentalize education in the name of what society says that it wants. It's not hard to imagine today a society in which the perceived value of speaking multiple languages is questioned in spite of the fact that the actual value, the proven value of speaking multiple languages is clear. And I think that's probably clear to those of us in this room. Moreover, language, as we would all agree, cannot be separated from culture. Indeed, the instrumentalization of education is destructive. With that in mind, it becomes important that Owen opens the article, Can or Should Spanish Literature Be Taught in the High School, Volume 6, Issue 1, from 1923, with the statement, quote, Literature is the expression and embodiment of that which is best in humanity. So we have the responsibility to critique the way in which this humanism was defined at the beginning of the century. The great books tradition, the power and exclusion, implicit in canon formation, and so on. But there's also a philosophical principle at work here that can be adapted for our 21st century humanism. Part of what Owen was doing was fighting against specialization. He was asserting Spanish as a, quote, cultural and humanistic, rather than merely, quote, practical or commercial. These are all, these are his words. He notes in a 1923 article that, quote, Spanish is already definitely established in the public mind as a practical or commercial subject. And Owen also writes that, quote, I take it for granted that all of us are agreed that the main purpose of education is to prepare for life rather than for earning a living. Now, this is a debate that's familiar to many of us in the 21st century. Uh, those of us who have seen the instrumentalized perspectives on education mixed poorly with budget cuts, with the gradual erosion of the relative autonomy that universities used to enjoy. And also, that's a, that's a great theme of Mary Bergen's book, Whatever Happened to the Faculty, Drift and Decision in Higher Education, which I highly recommend, from 2006. Okay, moving on to Agnes Marie Brady, another very interesting and important figure from the department here at KU. She was born in 1895. She passed away in 1987. She had the bachelor's and master's degrees from KU, and she had undertaken additional graduate study at Columbia University, <coughs> University of Chicago, National University of Mexico, University of Madrid, and the Sorbonne. She taught at St. Mary of the Woods College and at Bucknell University before returning here to KU as a faculty member, which she did in 1946. And in 1956, she served as president of the AATSP. Her obituary, which was written by Harley D. Oberhelman of Texas Tech University, states, quote, she was a pioneer in the development of the audiolingual method of foreign language teaching and in the teaching of foreign languages to children in elementary school. Brady published on Spanish poetry and Spanish American prose and also wrote in 1926, of the Juegos Florales of Kansas, which were held on May 5th that year in Baldwin, Kansas, uh, which actually I'm interested in learning more about. I was unable to find much information on that. Her record also shows a hallmark balance that I think is crucial for our fields, a balance between attention to literary study, to pedagogy, and to the development and extracurricular extension of our profession. A theme that allows us to think through Brady's legacy, once again, this is a theme with contemporary Resonance is that of outreach and engagement, or put another way, the building of community both inside and beyond the university. What emerges for me is that Brady was deeply aware of the need to overcome divisions between people, between one specialist and another, between the university and the elementary school, and at a much greater scale, the divisions between nations. So I'll draw three points from her record and legacy. Number one. We must not cater to divisions or divisive thinking. Brady publishes the article Individual Needs in Spanish in Volume 20, Issue 3 of Hispania from 1937. And therein she tackles several divisions in turn. First, national divisions. She writes that Spanish, quote, with English, is an instrument of peace to all Americans in this war-torn age. We must draw more closely together and let the common language that speaks the heart and mind of North and South America be mutually understood, though it be pronounced by two different tongues. This is still her, would it not be more conducive to peace to train Spanish-English and English-Spanish 
peacemakers who can speak to one another directly and understand one another? And where can they be trained but in our high schools and colleges where instruction in both languages ought to be given? Here in our schools, Spanish can and should be a peace trainer as well as a dollars and cents earner. Next, Brady approaches the distinction between practical and humanistic education from a perspective that differs from, but I believe also complements Owens. She states, quote, few students are potential research scholars. Few are going to do graduate work. Few are going to spend their time reading for pleasure. This is in 1937. <laughs> Sounds very resonant with today, right? Few are going to be able to secure teaching positions. All want to be able to earn a living. Departments can certainly benefit today from being reminded of this. And of course, in saying this, Brady's adding to and not dismissing the study of literature. Brady speaks also to the divisions of scholarly specialization, the geographical and temporal distinctions that are internal to our departments and journals, when she advocates an emphasis on teaching the literature of both Spanish and Spanish-American authors, and of teaching, quote, both the new and the old Spain. In addition, her own work shows that teacher education and outreach are not completely separate from this literary and cultural training, which brings us to point number two. The university has a social responsibility that goes beyond educating its own students. One of Brady's roles was to serve as director of the grade school program here at KU. Uh, in an article from volume 33, issue four of España from 1950, she writes that, quote, to stimulate an interest in the other children of the Americas and then of the world, a program was launched two years ago to teach Spanish in the elementary schools of Lawrence, Kansas. Brady was working with, quote, juniors and seniors with a major in Spanish in the School of Education at the University of Kansas. And she wrote that, quote, we now have in preparation as independent graduate work in the university's School of Education and Department of Spanish the making of standard tests to evaluate the program, the preparation of syllabi for teachers, the study of recruitment, training, and placing of teachers, and finally, the reevaluating of our Latin American area major to train teachers for a multi-phase course to develop the young pupils of Kansas in a new way of living. We hope our children will grow up understanding better the social, political, and economic relationships that we as a nation are obliged to have with all our neighbors. Two years later, in volume 35, issue four of Hispania, 1952, she published, quote, a, a teacher training program stating that, quote, our program is now in its third year. We have 450 children in the fifth, sixth, and seventh grades who are studying Spanish. Brady also acknowledges the tensions over the social value of language that I referred to earlier when she writes, quote, there have been some violent disagreements in professional gatherings as to the value of a foreign language. And then in parentheses she adds, it's hard for us to believe that there should be such persons in this shrinking world, exclamation point. And it's, it's not too hard to hear contemporary resonance in these words. Right? A further note on Brady's project that I'd like to share comes from her article, The Life Cycle of an Idea, which is from volume 37, issue one from 1954. And Aaron, she writes about receiving $10,000 in funding for the teacher training program over three years here. In today's numbers, this is over $100,000. And as I reflect on what she accomplished, uh, I consider how in the grant-centered cultures of today's public universities, any department would be glad to have uh, someone like Agnes Marie Brady among their faculty. And point number three that I take from Brady is an optimism about what we can accomplish uh, if, we're at, if we are successful at building community both within and beyond the university. In the concise note titled The President's Corner, which Brady published as president of the AATSP, volume 39, issue two, she stresses that, quote, we dare not lose sight of the warning that difficult times are ahead. United and with devotion to our field of teaching and research, we can grow even when resources are strained and backs bent under their load. This too has a contemporary resonance. So the six points that I've enumerated, three from Owen, three from Brady, um, these are absolutely crucial for today's context. And many of you have doubtless been engaged in reasserting the importance of these points. Uh, 
here and across the country in your efforts. So educators who teach the student, not the material, recognizing the individual and social needs of the student, the balance between those, not instrumentalizing education, not catering to divisive thinking, being inclusive in the approach, uh, the social responsibility of the university, and an optimism about what we can accomplish. So how we do all this uh, is highly dependent on context, the context of a certain historical moment, uh, as I think you can see also in the exhibit, <coughs> the strengths of a given department, a given group of faculty, the priorities of a given institution, the dynamics of a given city, of a given set of state politics, and of course national and international realities. Yet these scales of experience are interlinked. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons from KU's history, is how these different scales of experience are interconnected. I want to, I want to explore one further item. So this is the fact that the rise of Spanish as a, modern, as a form of modern language study was itself a reconfiguration in disciplinary terms. So in one of his articles titled The Spanish Teacher's Responsibility, which is from volume four, issue one of East Minor from 1921, Owen, Arthur Leslie Owen, returns to a statement that had been made in 1908 by Professor Raymond Weeks, a statement that Owen refers to as a prophecy. So Professor Raymond Weeks in 1908 had said, Quote, I will venture to predict that 25 years from now, 25 years from 1908, modern languages studied in this section of the country, the Middle West, will rank in numerical strength of enrollment as follows, Spanish, French, then German. Owen then remarked in 1921 that, quote, this seemed incredible at the time, in 1908 that is, when German was first, French a bad second, and Spanish a much worse third. These are, these are his remarks in 1921. It has probably come to pass, he says, this year, in 1921, that that dynamic has changed, although I have not seen the figures. So one can read in this shift, occurring prior to 1921, the social impact of World War I, to be sure, an impact that I imagine can be explored further by perusing this exhibit um, that we opened this evening. It is tempting to regard Owen's remarks as celebratory, that Spanish language has taken off that the AATS has formed, that there's a national conversation emerging about Spanish language education, that Spanish has, in his words, substituted for German. And it's really interesting to go back to these articles uh, from that era. 100 years later, this question of enrollments, um, for different reasons, is still one of the most significant affecting our profession. At public universities, with the gradual erosion of state support and federal grant monies, and despite the fact that Spanish and Portuguese are arguably more important than ever for today's students. Finding ways to communicate the continuing importance of our disciplines is crucial to continuing our programs and impact. Continuing our programs means, of course, being responsive and responsible and embracing change and adaptation to circumstances as the key value of our discipline's legacy. What I think is important when um, when we reflect on the generalized legacy of contributions of the KU department to our shared disciplines, it's to ponder the next 100 years with optimism and with intentionality. Owen and Brady's remarks reveal that there are certain tensions that we have had to navigate for quite some time, perennial tensions over geographic, thematic, pedagogical focus, over university curricula and their interconnection with communities beyond the university, over the individual and the social needs of students at all levels, and over the way we support and fund our programs. Yet I have an optimism that we can meet any challenge. It's difficult not to marvel at the way in which the various disciplines contained within Spanish and Portuguese have been able to continually innovate, to create, to borrow, absorb, reforge, deploy new approaches and paradigms, to participate in all of the new paths that scholarship, teaching, and learning are following throughout the humanities. All that's necessary also is to take a look at the centenary issue of these findings, which is available for free online. <laughs> from December 2017, and you'll see there that there are also authors in that centenary issue from KU's strong department of Spanish and Portuguese, which that was edited not by me, but by uh, editor Sherry Spanlong. So with these final words, I'll close my presentation. What happens in the next 100 years depends on how capacious our definition of Spanish and Portuguese disciplines can become. Thank you. so much, Benjamin, for such an informative and compelling presentation. I'm, 
I find it remarkable the way you were able to mine the rich history of the Spanish and Portuguese department at KU for really universal nuggets of wisdom for teachers and scholars. Thank you very much. I also want to express our sincere thanks to Santa Arias, who, along with help from Sylvia Muller, is was key to making this exhibit happen. So thank you. We would love to hear your feedback on the exhibit tonight. So if you would take a moment to fill out one of these feedback forms that are available on the welcome desk, we'd be really grateful. Finally, uh, well, not quite finally, but I need to say that Strong Foundations, the exhibit tonight, will be on display through January 31st. So please come back and see us. Bring your friends. Uh, you're always welcome in the KU libraries. Um, and lastly, I want to say, I want to ask you to consider becoming, if you're not already, a friend of the libraries. The Friends of the Libraries is a fundamental support for the work of the KU libraries, and it is an opportunity for anybody to have a lasting impact on the lives and education of every single Jayhawk. Please enjoy your evening. Uh, like I said, come back and see us and have a great time. Thank you very much. And rock, rock.